Ross better call somebody. Hey, yo, it's me, it's me, the R to the P, and yes, you better call somebody and tell them that the Old Culture Podcast has new merch. Finally! 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 Yes, finally, more than 20 items in stock at oldculturepodcast.com slash merch. Slap that sigil on your chest like a Superman or Wonder Woman and spread the message of infinite love, truth, and awareness. Both unisex and women's fits now available in a slew of different styles, including high-quality American apparel, tees, tanks, crop tops, hoodies, and long sleeves, plus designs that show off your wokeness, and hats for the alchemist deep within you because we are on a mission to make America great again. (laughs) Oh, no, Donald, you silly fuck. That's make alchemy great again. So transmute your wardrobe from lead to gold and conjure up oldculturepodcast.com slash merch. And you know what? Do that now and use coupon code Equinox and enjoy 10% off on all orders from now through the Fall Equinox. That's now through Sunday, September 23rd. You gotta be fucking kidding. Nah, dude, I'm not. I've labored for far too long on this to let this merch just sit around 10% off through Sunday, September 23rd with the coupon code Equinox at oculturepodcast.com slash merch. That's through the web store, not the Etsy shop. So follow the link in the show notes and manifest your heart's desire for some new swag because what fun is casting spells and summoning spirits without cozy ritual attire? So culturepodcast.com slash merch, use the coupon code Equinox, that's E-Q-U-I-N-O-X, and get 10% off all orders for the rest of the summer. Now let's drop that needle and roll that intro. Yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to Old Culture, where we've always found an encyclopedia to be quite magical. But our guest this time around has taken that to a whole new level. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Now, if you're like me and you're a fan of short stories, detective fiction, and the occult, then a book like The Wiser Book of Occult Detectives is something you rush to pick up at the old brick and mortar. So imagine my delight when that exact book arrived unexpectedly on my doorstep one day not too long ago. And imagine my further delight to see Judica Illis' name on the front cover of it. Because even if you're not into the occult, if you don't know much about the people who write in this genre, Judica's name is one you've seen if you've wandered through damn near any bookstore. Sadly though, if you're wandering through one of those chain bookstores, her books are typically lumped into the New Age section and relegated to a dimly lit corner in the back somewhere, but any curious bookworm will have undoubtedly seen her name at the bottom of a spine on those shelves, and that is exactly how this curious bookworm first learned the name of Judica Illis. Judica is, of course, a prolific scholar, educator, and author of several books of folklore, folkways, and mythology about the subjects of magic, the occult, divination, diverse spiritual traditions, witchcraft, and the paranormal. I originally reached out to her to discuss the wiser book of occult detectives, but as it turned out, that was only a drop in the old cauldron, because this chat took us in all kinds of directions. You might say it turned out to be a bit encyclopedic itself, because we wandered through many pages of the occult encyclopedia, and I think you will dig each and every entry here. So enough prologue, let's flip the script to dialogue and welcome into the house the wonderfully witchy woman known as Judica Illis. Enjoy. (laughs) Judica Illis, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you being here. Really excited to chat with you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem. So you are the mother of magical encyclopedias. You've written at least four (laughs) that I know of, plus some other guides to magic and witchcraft. Uh, But I am curious about how you came to be a witch who can sit down and write a book of, you know, 5,000 spells or more. 
So where did that journey begin for you? When did you first discover the magic in the world around you, but also the magic inside of yourself? Those are two different things about me. I, those are one, I have a lifelong interest in magic and witchcraft. And the other is I, I consider writing, writing is my skilled labor. I, I, I know how to write and I have, you know, back in the day before I was a published author, I, I've written websites for people. That's, you know, it is really my skilled labor. But how, where did it start? I don't know. You know, people always ask me that, and I know there are people who have these pivotal experiences in their life. You know, I was 14 and this happened, and that's when I found witchcraft. But that's not my story. My story is pretty much I was born this way. I, 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 I was a happy accident. I was my parents' happy accident. I am significantly younger than um, my nearest siblings and cousins. And they just sort of let me tag along like a puppy. And I learned how to read very early. And we had mystical books in the house. And I read everything. We had astrology books and numerology and palmistry. And they were there. I didn't really have to go looking for them. They came to me. And why they resonated so deeply with me, I, I don't know. But it, it, it was almost just like connecting the pieces. As soon as I encountered, it was love. I do remember, uh, you know, my sister bringing home the first deck of tarot cards I ever saw. I was six, and I know exactly how old I was because my sister is 12 years older than I am, and she had just started college, and she went to Cooper Union, which is in New York City's East Village, where the, you know, it's really a full circle story where the Samuel Weiser bookstore was at that time. And that's where she bought a deck of tarot cards, the BOTA, and brought them home. And uh, that I remember very distinctly. I, I just fell in love with them. But already, you know, even by the time I was six, I don't remember a time when I wasn't in love with witches. You know, it was a little bit of the golden age of television, too. There was, you know, the Addams Family and Bewitched, and my mother liked fairy tales, and I grew up on them. And, you know, Hansel and Gretel, I identified with the witch. That's a horror story to me because of what happens to the witch, not because of what happens to the children. So that's, <laughs> yeah. that, you know, that's that's just, that's kind of how I, how I came here. The encyclopedias were not initially supposed to be encyclopedias. I had done two previous books, which are now, they went out of print in their original titles, and they were republished and repackaged by Wiser Books, so they are now known as the Big Book of Practical Spells and Magic When You Need It. And Magic When You Need It in particular is a little spell book. It's, uh, it, it was designed as a, as a little toolkit for emergency situations, so there are 151 spells in that book. And the person who was my editor knew I collected spells, and that's a whole other story, but he knew I had tons of spells. I just, I was just collecting them just really for myself, for my own, for my own happiness and curiosity and edification. And he asked whether I wanted to do a big book of spells. And that was one of the original working titles, the big book of spells, the joy of spells. It wasn't initially an encyclopedia. You know, and how many spells can you get into this book? And at one point there were up to 10,000, but then the publisher decided they wanted 5,000. And I said, okay, because I don't really think in numbers. You know, I was telling you before, I am not a technical adept. I'm not a mathematical adept either. And, you know, he said 5,000. And I said, sure. But neither one of us had thought about how many spells you can squeeze onto a page. It was supposed to be a 450-page book. I have a contract that I probably should frame for a 450 page book to be done in a certain amount of time. And it was, you know, it was really a nightmare because, uh, by the time I had written it, the introduction and stuck a couple spells in there and the first spells I put in there were my favorites, which are these, you know, really long Moroccan spells with, you know, multiple, multiple steps and ingredients. And, you know, I already had a hundred pages and clearly this was not going to be a 450 page book. And I, I spent most of that book being, writing the book being convinced they were going to cancel it and I was never going to write again. And, you know, I'd have to give back the money and I didn't have it anymore. And at some point they told me they, the publisher, changed the name of the book to Encyclopedia of 5,000 Spells. 
And I was so relieved because I realized at that point they weren't going to cancel. You know, once they were calling it an encyclopedia, and it was originally the Element Encyclopedia, and Element refers to the publisher. You know, it was it was published by Harper Element, and uh, that was that was such a relief to me. I can't even tell you. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. So you said that you know writing is your real skill, and I, I have to agree. I mean. I haven't read all of your books, but the ones that I have read, you have just a, a command of the language, like few that I have seen. When did you start writing then? Were you always right? I mean, I know you're a huge fiction fan. So did yeah. you start writing fiction then first? Yeah. Although I find, honestly, I find nonfiction much less stressful to write. English is not my first language. And that is, I think, uh, an important thing about me. English is not my first language. And it took me a long time to speak it well. You know, I'm the child of Hungarian refugees. I was born in the U.S., but they hadn't been here very long. And their uh, command of English is, uh, at that time, was not wonderful. Um, you know, then I went to elementary school in New York City, where I went to school with a lot of other immigrants. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, I joke that Hungarian was my first language, Spanglish my second, Ebonics my third, and then eventually I moved to New Jersey where other children let me know that I was not speaking well. And, you know, I have Mercury and Leo and I don't like to look stupid. And uh, I put a lot of effort into learning how to master the English language. And I, ironically, I ended up as, I don't, I, I don't even know if it's ironic, I ended up as an English major in uh, college. And um, it's something, I have no air planets, air signs in my chart. I mean, it's it's... The fact that I can write now is actually kind of amazing. It's very typical of metaphysical authors. We have a lot of authors who have a lot of things to say and are very, very knowledgeable and really brilliant people, but don't have writing skills. And then we have people with, you know, good writing skills who um, sometimes coast on that. And it's good to find the people, you know, in the middle or for the people who have a lot to say, you know, I, I am I am a living testimony that you can learn, you know, writing is a skill that can be learned, mastering the English language. I mean, I see even the difference in the last 10 years. Uh, I, I've been really blessed to work with some wonderful, wonderful copy editors who, you know, I, I sometimes I, I go back to my old writing. I'd like to write it again because I think I could do it better now. You know, I majored in English too, and I was I was uh, forced to choose a concentration. It's what they called it at the university I went to, and you had to choose between like professional writing, technical writing, yeah. or creative writing. So obviously, yeah. I chose creative writing. That sounds like the funnest, right? It's also the right. one that pays, <laughs> that pays the least afterwards. That aside, I mean, I thought that was a tremendous skill set that I had developed and was taught in college that has served me well yeah. moving forward. You know, it really, really fed my sort of natural curiosity. I'm a Scorpio and I got to solve all these mysteries, right? Yeah, Scorpio Moon, I know, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's probably why you edited the book you did that I want to talk about later. But uh, before we get to that, you know, one thing I'd like to get your take on, and I should preface this by saying that I'm not a practicing occultist or magician or witch. I've, I've cast one sigil in my life and it's the logo for the show here. So <laughs> with that in mind, I have a maybe an unhealthy disdain for groups and, yeah. and organized well, groups. Well, that's a Scorpio thing. Yeah. 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 I have no desire to join a magical no. order or be affiliated yeah. with one. Yeah. I have no desire to participate in group spells or group workings. And again, not a practitioner here. But if I was, I know that I would prefer a, a private, individualized approach to it because for some reason, I just think it'd be more effective. But I'm going to question myself through you here. Am I just being antisocial, or is group work more effective than individual work? No, What's your take on this? I, I actually, I, I agree with you. I think in general, individual work is more effective. And, you know, but I, mean, I will say, you know, that might be my Scorpio moon, speaking to your Scorpio sun. I find individual work to be the most effective. I find that sometimes when you want to do group work, it is good to be selective about, you know, not to automatically have the same old group that meets, you know, you know, every Sunday we get together. Uh, 
it is sometimes good to make sure because because the point of a spell and when you begin a spell and I teach spell casting one of the things the first things that you really have to determine is what is the goal of your spell and to really be clear and concise as to what is it that you know what is the change that you wish to occur and what is the form in which that change should take and I find that, you know, people don't always, there is this assumption that everybody wants what you want in the same way. And even people who love you and want what's, you know, what they think is best for you might not be what you think is best for you. And people are very complicated. And I, I personally find that individual work is the most effective. However, this is one of the beautiful things about spell work. And about the whole spell casting process, which, you know, I think is probably the oldest human art form, is that people are complex and complicated. And, you know, we are all special snowflakes and we don't need the same things or desire the same things. We don't all operate the same way. And there, I know that there are people who prefer group work and maybe that's better for them. So I don't. I, I don't want everybody now, and I'm saying that, you know, individual is most effective. I, you know, I'm not telling you to go out and dissolve your group or, you know, if you find that it's working for you, because this is all practical, does it work? And if it's working for you, then clearly you're doing something right. But what's right for one person might not be right for another. You know, how, how do you, how does someone write four encyclopedias? That someone has to be willing to sit in a room by themselves and be pretty antisocial, because otherwise, how do you write? I mean, it, it, you have to you have to be productive. Books tend to be written on schedules, and you know the time frame is never enough. So I'm a person who I'm not afraid to be by myself. I, I enjoy my own company. I, I I am okay, you know, going for long periods of time without a lot of social life. But, you know, not everybody's the same. So so you have to do what works for you. Definitely, yeah. I mean, and you sitting by yourself, you know, in that room writing encyclopedia. I, I mean, that that's magic right there. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think we need to yeah. keep that in mind, too. So, and along with the group work, do you think that that bind Trump spell is actually working? Uh, it doesn't seem too effective to me. Not to get too political. Yeah. Not to get too political. I mean, I, I don't want to criticize. I mean, I think... I think that it is empowering, you know, and I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I am currently editing, you know, I, I work as an editor for Wiser Books and I am editing David Salisbury's book. And, you know, if you had David Salisbury's, which we have in 2019, and if you had David Salisbury sitting here or Michael Hughes, they might tell you something very, very different than I would tell you. And, you know, who's to say who's right? I know that these spells are are empowering for the people who do them. And I think it is better to be casting spells than to be hopeless or to feel disempowered. And ultimately, that is what spells do. They, they encourage you to take control of your destiny. They encourage you not to be passive. And so in, you know, in that sense, I think it's probably a good thing. The problem with group spells in general and not necessarily with that one specifically but in general is in I, I talk about this in my books i talk about this in five thousand spells and i probably in the big book of practical spells too I, I sometimes forget what's in which book the problem is is that for spells to work and it's why emergency spells sometimes work the best everybody has to be really kind of tuned into the same frequency and want the same thing and Sometimes that gets really, really specific. And sometimes, you know, I teach a lot about why your spells don't work. Because the spells that don't work are sometimes more interesting than the spells that do work. The spells that don't work sometimes don't work because the spellcaster is ambivalent. It's like driving with your brake, um, you know, it's like dri driving with a handbrake on. You're, you're going, but you're not getting there very effectively. A lot of times people will cast spells, and I, I, in, just in general, you know, you cast spells for a job because everybody tells you this is a great opportunity for you 
or because you're scared of running out of money or you you think you want that job, but really in your heart, you don't want it. Really in your heart, you're just sick of everything and you want to go off to the beach and like write poetry or something. And that conflict of emotion, sometimes like it just kind of creates a state of inertia, you know, and so if you multiply that, the more people you multiply that by, you can imagine how much more ambivalence. I would recommend that anybody who's participating in it should probably do their own stuff too. You know, you know, it, it, it is good to participate in a group thing, but then if you have something in your head, maybe you should do it as an individual too, whatever that is. That makes a lot of sense, and uh, coming from you, I would think that would be uh, almost mandatory advice for anybody listening who's into that. Because if you can en envision a spell as being like an energy transfusion, it's got to come through clear, you know, clear and strong and not wavering and not kind of like wobbly. You, you want it to be really true. You know, my aim is true. And so as an individual, the small things are sometimes easier to work on. I mean, what does it, you know, what specifically do you want to happen? Is there, is there a thing, you know, the more you can narrow it down. I do sometimes in classes, we'll do a spell together and I, I will, I will get, you know, somebody will volunteer and say, I need a spell for this. And then we'll sit there and narrow down exactly what do you, what do you want to happen? And it's, it's easier said than done. But one of the, there are all kinds of benefits of spell casting and among them is clarity of vision. It, it will teach you to really refine your vision of what you want, what you don't want, and to really hear and see how the people around you, what are they saying to you? How are they treating you? You know, spell casting has lots of benefits beyond just the spell working. And I look at the, uh, I look at the magic circle like I do a circle of friends, you know, keep it small. Yeah. Keep it tight. Yeah. Keep it private. So, yeah. But like I said, I'm not a practitioner here. But if I was, that would be how I would well, approach it. For sure. I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You are. You are. You know, I'm sorry, I, I say that from experience. I mean, I know that I have done. I've certainly done group work. I, I had a small coven. I was a member of a small coven at one point, and uh, I think the most effective things we did for each other were, uh, you know, one person really, really, really needed a new job, you know, desperately. And, and we were, we were all in harmony on that. We, we wanted her to, to succeed. And, you know, because, you know, if she didn't get a new job, she'd lose her apartment and it's like a whole chain reaction. And that was incredibly effective. But I, I'll tell you, eventually that coven fell apart because people are complicated and your desires may not be somebody else's desires. Even if they like you and they love you and they're your friend and they'll, you know, they'll help you out in some circumstances. It doesn't mean that everything you desire in your life is exactly what the other person desires. Sometimes there's a conflict there. So where do you stand on spells that interfere with other people's lives, perhaps? I mean, because, you know, magic spellcasting is inherently sort of selfish. Like, it's, it's really just meant to better your experience here, at least just from what I know. But you're more experienced, obviously. So where do you stand on, well, I you guess know, the, go the goal of spell testing? I mean, ideally, you know, it would be a nice world. In a perfect world, everybody is relatively happy and, you know, able to, you, you know, live a fulfilling life. I, I don't know. The, the problem, one of the problems, and I talk about this in my book and with my book, Encyclopedia of Witchcraft, is that we use words in the English language, we don't have a lot of distinct words to talk about magic and witchcraft. And the word witch is used to represent a spellcaster, but it's also used by people in a, in a spiritual sense and in a religious sense. And they are not exactly the same thing. And so, of course, you know, the Wiccan read, do what you will and it harm none. I, I don't know that you can live a life where you harm none. I, I don't know that that's possible because, for example, we did that, that spell that helped our friend get the job she wanted, which, you know, really 
sort of saved her the direction that she wanted her life to go in. But, you know, clearly there's one job and all kinds of other people who want it. I mean, whoever gets a job, somebody else didn't. Sometimes your good fortune comes at somebody else's. You know, you know, you can be more extreme. You know, if you, you're trying to get the list, uh, get to the top of the list of a transplant list, which could literally be a lifesaver. But, you know, there might be somebody else on that list also. So, I mean, what, what do you do? Do you stand back and let other people, I mean, you know, that, that's for the individual to decide. There is a theory of magic from, it's one of the creation stories from, from ancient Egypt. And in this creation story, and Egypt has, you know, multiple, multiple creation myths. But in this myth, so the creator, you know, creates the world and looks out upon it and sees that it is not all good and that human beings are in for heartache. And so magical energy, Heka, H-E-K-A in the Egyptian terminology, However, you know, we've now bastardized that, you know, the Egyptian word. Heka is created magical energy for humans to use to forestall heartache and the blows of disaster. And so it's a hard thing to say, you, you know, but magic is all about personal gain. Every, every couple of weeks I get uh, a, an email from somebody who's been watching Charmed and, you know, not for personal gain. But, you know, that, that, was, that was written as entertainment by people who are not occultists or practitioners. And television is usually a little ambivalent about, you know, how witches and practitioners are portrayed. So that's not real. That, that's an entertainment device. It is all about personal gain. It is all about keeping your loved ones safe and keeping, you, you know a roof over your head and, you know, attempting to be secure and loved and all those, you know, whatever it is, healthy, whatever it is that the individual desires. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know that that's possible. I, I would like to point out, it, it's something I end up saying whenever I'm discussing magic. Magic is the type of energy that you can use, but magic spells and spellcraft and witchcraft have traditionally for millennia, been the province of the poor and the marginalized and the disenfranchised, because there are other kinds of power in the world, too. There's economic power. There's brute physical strength. And they're more efficient. If you've got enough money or you have enough cachet or whatever it is to, to bully your way into success... It is probably faster. Magic spells are, have traditionally been the province of people who either have a calling to the esoteric and maybe are just doing it because they have that, that calling for the ecstatic and the esoteric and the spiritual, and that's a whole other thing. But in general, and people sometimes look at spells and, and they seem negative or, or nasty or malevolent, but you have to appreciate these are, these are the spells that weren't intended to keep battered women safe to keep slaves from you know having their families sold out from under them to just provide yourself a margin of safety from people who could avail themselves of those other kinds of power you know you you do have to keep that perspective in your head because you know spells to bind trump if people are not casting spells if they're frustrated enough what are they going to do well that is a fair point and if that's the case we should all be trying to bind all politicians and <laughs> not not just presidents but congressmen they're really the oh. ones that we got to watch out for oh oh yeah absolutely i mean he, he is just the tip of the iceberg he, he didn't get there by himself and he's not accomplishing what he's accomplishing by himself definitely yeah so transitioning a little bit i've heard you in many many interviews the last few years and there are a couple things i've heard you say before that i love to tease out here the first is you love and this is going back to your writing and uh, your day-to-day -day job here but you love the research process i do and I do. As, as someone who has written all these encyclopedias i think you'd have to because you don't just sit down and write a book of you know five thousand spells no. and i haven't published anything but i i do like to write on my own well when i can i guess but i also enjoy that research process probably why i do the podcast here because it's really just all research 
But I'm curious, you know, what is it about that process that you enjoy so much? It's like, it's just intellectual archaeology. You're just digging. I don't know. You know, it's my Scorpio moon. I, I like mysteries. I, I love any kind of a mystery. And you just start looking for things. And I, I find, I find sometimes it is easier. Like when, if I go to be a speaker someplace, it is easier if you are a one trick pony, if you only have one thing you do, because then people know, you know, what box to put you in. But I have a lot of interests. I, I find a lot of things very fascinating. And, you know, people always want to know, well, where do the spells come from? I, I find people interesting. A lot of it comes from just speaking with people and people telling me stuff. You know, a myst I have a book called Encyclopedia of Mystic Saints and Sages. While I was writing that, every time I would find myself in a cab, I'd ask the cab driver who was protecting the cab. And, you know, they'd pull off the road and, like, turn off the meter and, like, pull something out from under the, you know, the front passenger seat that their grandma had given them. It, so, so interesting. So, um, I don't know, you know, I, you know, sometimes you're just, you're just wired certain ways. I, 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 you know, I love Nancy Drew and Kay Tracy when I was a kid. I, I like a mystery and it's all a mystery. So I, I love, you know, you know, how long did it take you to read 5,000 spells? But the researching, I was doing that for years before, you know, the writing itself is one thing, but I had, I had the material. I had m most of the material already. So those are two different things, writing and, and having the material to report. I, I find writing to be work. I try to write well and, um, you know, I agonize, but every comma. So for me, that, that's a job. But the, but the research, oh, it's so interesting. And you meet interesting people and you learn, you know, you learn something new every day. And just, you know, the more you learn, the more you realize you know nothing and how much more there is to learn. Yeah, I think that's one thing that I've learned uh, just the past couple of years doing this project here. So you can do one of these things the rest of your life, Judica, writing, editing, or researching. Which is it? Huh, if people would pay me to research, I would do that. Absolutely. Actually, if I could do one thing, if I had to pick one thing, I would read cards. That is my, my really? true love. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've been a card reader. I've been a professional card reader since, you know, it's scary. Like it's, I think I'm in my 30th year of being a professional card reader. It's like scary how fast the time goes, but that is, that never gets old for me. And I, it's not the thing I do the most anymore. It's probably the thing I do the least, but, but it's, it's what I love the most. Have you ever tried to read with a regular deck of playing cards? Yes. Yes. And there are people who prefer it. Really? Why is that? I don't know. I mean, I mean, first of all, it's innocuous. There are, for a lot of people, traditionally conjure workers, a lot of folk magic practitioners, you know, in, in Europe, uh, you know, Romani, they will read with, with playing cards. They're cheap. They're, they don't, they're, they're not obviously magical. And sometimes discretion is a good thing. You know, it's not always safe. So, you know, that discretion is a good thing. And it, it's, I think, I think it's harder. There's, there's more of a skill involved. If you are reading with tarot cards, especially the Rider Waite Smith inspired cards, where every, every card is illustrated, including the minor cards, you know, they tell you a story. And so it's a little bit easier. You don't have to remember as much. But if you are working with cards where, you know, it's, it's a five of hearts and a four of hearts and a three of hearts, and you're just looking at a card with, a, you know, some hearts on it, you have to really know what that card means. But if you're a diviner, in my experience, if you are really a diviner, you can divide with anything. And I, I say that because in, a, in an absolute emergency once where someone needed me to read for them and I did not have cards with me, I ended up doing a reading with Pokemon cards because that's what we had. Oh, shit. <laughs> and it worked. It was a really good reading. So in addition to the Pokemon cards, I guess, what's the strangest thing you've divined with over the course of your life here? That would be it. Really? Okay. That would be it. That would be it. I usually carry a deck of tarot cards with me, especially after that. I usually have uh, in my purse someplace I have, I have some kind of a deck because... Because the situations arise. Is your go-to deck the Rider-Waite-Smith, or is it something else? 
I love a lot of decks. My go-to deck as a reader is the Rider Waite Smith because I find that it's so reliable. Sometimes I don't like reading with it because it is the deck that other people are most familiar with. And often people will, people have very strong feelings about which cards they like and they don't like. And so sometimes I like to have an unfamiliar deck. You know, when I read, sometimes I'll have extra decks with me. I love the Halloween Tarot by Kipling West. That's, I love that deck. You know, I, I have some decks, the, the Raziel Tarot that uh, Rachel Pollock did with Robert Place. Uh, I have a Klimt Tarot. You know, I, I, I have tarots that I, I love, but I, you know, I used to work in a psychic hotline, so I understand you know, where, where people are very impatient. They're paying, they're paying by the minute, and all they want to do is get off the phone. And the, the writer, Wade Smith, is very reliable and very dependable, and you could wake me up at 3 in the morning and I just do a reading for you. Off the <laughs> and I have, so, you know, just like that, yeah. no preparation if I had to. That's what they call a cold reading, right? Yeah. Some people aren't too fond of those, though, for some reason. Why is that? I can't speak for someone else. You know, I did work on a hotline. That was my boot camp. I want to say between 1990, 1991 to about 1993, I worked on, on psychic hotlines. You know, it was the time when it was popular. And you, it was like boot camp because you don't have time to get people's vibes. You know, you don't have time to to kind of look at them. I used to have people coming to my house and I would see how, you know, how my dog reacted to them or how they reacted to my dog. And that would tell me something. But when you're doing it just like that, you have to, you know, it is that real, really going out on that tightrope with the cards and just, you just look at what's in the cards and respond to sort of the flashes that you get and, and hope that you're, you're being helpful and responsible. I also know you love old esoteric and occult fiction, uh, which we kind of alluded to earlier. Yeah. You actually edited the Wiser Book of Occult Detectives last year, and I'd like to talk yes. a bit about that because I thought it was just a phenomenal collection of stories. Thank you. you I love <laughs> those books. I did two of them. I yeah. did one called The Fantastic Book of the Year Before and then Occult Detectives. And I, I, I love them. And I, I, I hope people will buy a lot of them so that they'll let me do another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you also wrote a great introduction to the collection as well. And as it relates to occult fiction or esoteric fiction in general what is it about that particular genre that appeals to you so much i don't know you know it's the ambiance the atmosphere i like that you can read them in multiple levels you can just read them as stories you know some of them are very well written and they're fun but if you you know in the same way as fairy tales if you have the ears to recognize the theme you you can glean a lot of esoteric knowledge from them. I like just this the whole the whole vibe of these stories and maybe because I read them when I was young. We had, you know, Marie Corelli books in the house and I, I, I you know, I just love them. I love that blending of the magical with the mundane because I think for a lot of people they, they want they want to keep the magical in a box. You know, uh, I'm going to go around my mundane bas- business and then, you know, October 31st I'm going to have a magical moment. And for me, I love when they blend together all the time. I remember the first time I saw the series of Twin Peaks, the, the original series, the way the esoteric was blended in. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't sort of a stand back. Now we're going to have a magical moment. And, you know, there, you know the, the smoke and lights. It was just, just very much very natural. Because I think for people who are living an esoteric life, it's just... It's just part of your life. It, it's it's not set apart from, you know, sometimes I hear people talk about, well, you know, in real life, but it's all real life. Or, you know, get a life, but this is a life. You know, and I, I love that blending of it. I don't know. I, I just, I, I really enjoy them. And I think, I think there are a lot of unheralded heroes out there. And I wish people would read more in general. Not so much in the metaphysical community, because... The metaphysical community tends to be a community of readers, and I really appreciate that. We're still book buyers and book readers and book discussers. I've been seeing on Twitter this discussion about whether we need libraries. I mean, how can you even ask that question? But the fact that people are is so sad. 
And I think, you know, going back to, you know, spells to bind certain political leaders, I think part of our, we don't read anymore. People are, you know, we're not, we're not as familiar with things anymore. We should be familiar with more concepts and more points of view. And it just, it, it opens up the world. And um, there is this huge school of, at the end of the 19th century, going into pre-World War II, maybe maybe even just closer to World War I, but, you know, some, some of it lingers after that. You just have all these magazines. You know, there's no TV at that point. There, you know, movies are not as they are now. You know, there, there are less forms of entertainment. And so you've got these great stories that I think were considered very disposable at that time, especially the more magical stories. You know, they were the weirdest of the weird, the strangest of the strange, and people didn't take them very seriously. But there's some, you know, Algernon Blackwood is such a great writer, and there's so much information in there. And, you know, especially, you know, the, the, the female authors have just been, I can't even say they've been abandoned, because I don't think anybody paid attention to most of them anyway with, you know, Dion Fortune as the, as the exception. Yeah, and you mentioned Twin Peaks during that answer. Yeah. And I think that that is absolutely one of the best modern examples of blending, like you said, the esoteric just into the landscape of, of everything, really. And you actually had a quote from Twin yeah. Peaks co-creator Mark Frost yes. that you used in your, your intro to the Wiser yes. Book of Occult Detectives. What was that quote exactly? Why did you put that in there? I usually start books with epigraphs and epigraph is a quote and I'm not looking at the books. I can't quote it to you exactly, but it took me a very long time to find an epigraph for that book. I have a nice Virginia Woolf quote for the wiser book of the fantastic and forgotten. There's a very good Lovecraft quote that Lon Milo Duquette, he, he wrote the first book in that series and he got that quote before me. And I was looking and looking and looking and I had bought the book, the secret history of twin peaks and twin peaks is, is uh, a large part of my life because at the time it first came out, I was married to someone who worked at ABC and who actually worked on the advertising for that show. He worked on the marketing and the advertising. So I was very, very aware of that show. I mean, it's, it's actually a, it, it's a funny story because ABC did not expect it to do well. And he used to put things on, he used to bring home pilots for me. And uh, he would tell me I watch television wrong because I, I watch very intently. And he would bring home stuff. And if I liked it, you know, he would go. I, I was his market research. If I liked it, it was the kiss of death. But I remember <laughs> so distinctly, he would say, he told me, this isn't going to do well, but you should watch this. It's slow and you're going to like it. And I did. And I, you know, when Sarah Palmer has her visionary experiences early in the show, I cried. Because I don't think I'd ever seen similar visionary experiences, A, portrayed, and B, treated with respect. So that was very, very profound for me. I had bought The Secret History of Twin Peaks, and I had not read it because I was busy with the book. And then on a day where, I don't know, I took a break, I flipped it open, and there was the quote. And it is a quote about how mystery leads to wonder. And what, it's, 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 do you, If you have the book there... Now I feel bad that I don't have a copy of the book here because I'd read it out loud. I do have it here. Let me just read it real quick. So this is, as you said, from The Secret History of Twin Peaks by Mark Frost, who co-created the uh, TV series with David Lynch. But the quote is, A wise man once told me that mystery is the most essential ingredient of life for the following reason. Mystery creates wonder, which leads to curiosity, which in turn provides the ground for our desire to understand who and what we truly are. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? It is beautiful. And, you know, I have to tell you, I actually, I read The Secret History of Twin Peaks about a year ago in preparation for an episode that I did here on the show about it. And that quote did stick out to me. I actually highlighted it in the book because <laughs> I thought that's it was great. so cool. Yeah. 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 That's great. Mark Frost is a really good writer. He has some novels also, which are, which are really wonderful. What do you make of Twin Peaks The Return? I've watched it in its entirety three times at this point. I loved it. But I I'm just happy for David Lynch and Mark Frost to lead me on a journey. Definitely, yeah. It, it was I mean, quite I, a journey. I find that part ahead. of researching also, though, is that it's not... I, when I research, I'm not necessarily... You know what I said about spells, that you have to know where you're going with the spell? It's very important to have that focus. With research, it's just finding... You know, it's just pretty much... I don't know what I'm going to find. That's the beauty of it. I, you know, I, you just fall down the rabbit hole and 
let it lead you. And it, and it can become a very, very spiritual experience. I thought it was amazing. I thought that, uh, is it, is it episode eight with the, uh, with the Trinity, with the Trinity site? The, the, uh, I, I thought that was maybe some of the, I mean, definitely, I think the most incredible television I've ever seen and maybe the most incredible film I've ever seen, period. Yeah. And I don't want to make this whole thing about Twin Peaks because we could definitely, uh, that's, that's a, <laughs> That'll be another show. <laughs> we could have a marathon about that for sure. Yeah. yeah. And we probably should because it's definitely worthy of that. But yeah. I do want to talk more about the occult detectives because I'm really interested in that. And that phrase, occult detective, it seems pretty self explanatory, but tell people who don't know what that means, what it actually means. It actually could mean different things. It is, when you start looking at it, it is a very huge genre. You know, Dale Cooper from Twin Peaks is an occult detective. Mulder and Scully, occult detectives. An occult detective is either someone who is exploring the unknown or the esoteric or less mundane. So, you know, the X-Files, I think, for a lot of people are an uh, introduction to occult detectives, but occult detectives could also be people with occult powers or occult knowledge who are using those, using those skills to investigate any kind of a crime. So, um, you know, hypothetically, Dr. Strange could be perceived as an occult detective. It could be someone, uh, a medium who who comes into a room, you know, with, where there's a murder and somebody with, with psychometric powers, you know, they touch, they touch things in, in the room and they, and they can see what happened and they solve the murder in that way. And sometimes there's an overlap of the two. There is, for example, in the Wiser Book of Occult Detectives, one of my favorites is the Sax Romer story, Morris Claw and Sax Romer's more, uh, you know, he, he's well known for writing the Fu Manchu stories, but he also created other characters. And Morris Claw is the dream detective. And he solves most of the crimes are, are fairly mundane. There's an esoteric story. He, he features in about 12 stories. And, and I'm telling you this off the top of my head, the exact number is in the book. Most of them are fairly mundane. You know, he solves a theft or, or a crime by he goes into the room and he he goes to sleep and he dreams it and he dreams up the solution and can see it and I, I i find all these things so fascinating i do as well and you mentioned some famous examples uh dale cooper from twin peaks Mulder and scully from the x files who else yeah. in literature specifically would people know of that would be considered an occult detective here uh there you know there's there are examples in the book they, they tend not to be as popular you know it's interesting because of course, Sax Romer, you know, is most famous for Fu Manchu, and Arthur Conan Doyle, most famous for Sherlock Holmes, but he also had occult detectives, and there's an example of one of those stories in, in, in the Wiser Book of Occult Detectives. I think Dr. Van Helsing in Dracula is one that people are very familiar with. You know, what exactly happens? You know, here we have this, this situation that is not a run-of-the-mill situation, and so you bring in someone who has, you know, not run of the mill skills to to be able to to actually see what's going on. For a lot of people identify Van Helsing as the first of the occult detectives, but it's an old genre. You know, there are um, Chinese and Jewish examples, uh, folkloric examples that go back centuries. So in English, in the English language, probably Van Helsing would be would be the first of the famous ones. There's, yeah, you know, the Umberto Echo would. book, you know, uh, Foucault's Pendulum. Uh, I, you could argue that, you know, the name of the rose, you know, is that an occult detective? You know, you can argue these things. Agatha Christie has got her, her more esoteric stories were never as popular as, as, as the cut and dry. You know, I think she, she, she's another one who sort of got, this is the box you're going to, this is the box we like for you. And so stay in it. But, mm -hmm. but she had some interesting, she has the one from ancient Egypt. She's got some very interesting stories also. Yeah, you mentioned Van Helsing from Dracula. That was in 1897, and like you said, he's widely considered the first occult detective, but you yes. have stories in the book that go back further than that, yes. so definitely yes. not yes. the case there. And let's back up to 1841. This is when Edgar Allan Poe published The Murders yep. in the Rue Morgue, widely yes. considered the first modern detective story. I know it's not really occult, but the main character, uh, C. Auguste Dupin, 
He's so good, and his methods just always struck me as legitimately supernatural, and I mean that in the most literal way, just so bizarrely abnormal, but in, like, the most brilliant, positive way. Is there any way we could pigeonhole him into this subgenre? Sure. I mean, you know, it's very fluid. I, I always think that, you know, and I mean, and, you know, at the end you end up in sort of fan fiction where you're, you know, you're pushing the envelope. I, I'm very fond of Sherlock Holmes, and I think Sherlock Holmes... You know, it's all about the logic, logic, and rationality and observation. But he plays the violin and he meditates and he's the opium. And, you know, I don't know. You know, I, I'm not sure that there isn't some visionary visionary impact in there also. I think there has to be. It, it seems like it's they're just too sharp. You know, they're too sharp yeah, for the sharp. average. Right. Yeah. I, I agree. Well, speaking of Sherlock Holmes, you know, I, I don't remember where this was from, but I read that scholars trace the beginnings of the occult detective genre to after Sherlock Holmes first appeared uh, in 1887. And we just said, like, that's not the case. You have stories in here that clearly predate that, which means the genre is older than people think. And you may have already answered that, but but how far back does it really go? Like, can we trace a a line there? Or is it sort of like, oh, we have examples here and there, but we're not really sure. You know, it's interesting that you say that because there is a whole school, and I want to say that there is an author named Tim Prassel, who, whose research is on pushing the genre and trying to establish exactly when, you know, can we pinpoint when the first occult detective story exists. And the first one in my book is uh, from 1855, and it's called The Pot of Tulips by Fitzjames O'Brien. And in context, you have to put it in context with the rise of spiritualism and the Fox sisters. And all of a sudden, the occult, which most of the, you know, the witch panic had died down by the 1700s, but there were still occasional witches being executed here and there. And for most of the past 2000 years, it has not been acceptable in Western society to be too interested in metaphysical topics, pretty much, you know, this is ancient Rome, not a witch friendly society, you know, so this goes back before even the church. All of a sudden, in the mid 19th century, you have this explosion where it has many roots. You have the spiritualists, you have this fascination with, you know, the post Napoleonic Egyptomania, the fascination with ancient Egypt. And Ancient Egypt is probably the last magic-friendly society. And, you know, and then you have the Civil War, and then spiritualism, they were having seances in the White House. And Lincoln attended at least one of them. So, you know, and the whole concept of the Ouija board, post-exorcist, it's all about, you know, oh my God, don't use it, it's it's dangerous, it's satanic. But originally the whole concept of the Ouija board or the spirit board was so you didn't have to hire a professional medium. You could, you could contact your own dead in your own house privately. And in the fact that they were sold and open, it was a whole different way of looking at the occult. So I think stories that had been told privately and secretly, and in my book, Encyclopedia of Witchcraft, I talk a lot about fairy tales, because you'll find a lot of magical and shamanic information embedded very quietly in the fairy tales if you know how to listen for it, all of a sudden you didn't have to do that. And at this time, you know, and in, in further context, you still could not publish nonfiction books on witchcraft and the magical arts. You know, that for various reasons, depending where you were, that was still not legal. But you could talk about it in a story. I've got this, there's a great story in, in this book about a, a woman who solves, uh, it's called um, The Dead Hand, and the, the detective is Diana Marburg, and it, the story's from 1902. And she solves, she solves a murder via palmistry. She's a professional palmist. And she's a society girl, and she doesn't really need the money, but she's, you know, very devoted to palmistry, and she does parties. And as a tarot reader, I've done parties back in the day. I, I, I've done baby showers and bridal showers, and, you know, you sit in the corner, and it's part of the entertainment for the guests. And I, I just, I enjoy the whole, the whole genre where, you know, in some ways, even though these are pulp stories that were, I think, 
maybe in some cases, even by their authors, expected to be disposable. You know, the way uh, 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 comics were considered disposable. You bought them, you read them, you threw them away. But these occult detectives are treated with respect. And the magic in these stories, in general, it's real. And to be able to, to see that as somebody who, I mean, for me, this is very real. I talk to people sometimes and I can see that they don't, they can't tell whether I'm pulling their leg or not. This is real for me. You know, it's not, it's not something I pull out just to write a book and walk, you know, walk away from. And so to see it portrayed as real in these stories, it's very meaningful. Yeah. Your stories range from the years 1855 to 1922 you mentioned a couple of things that happened during that time frame, the spirit board, the Ouija board, and then the rise of spiritualism. A couple other things that listeners might be aware of. Uh, this is also when the Golden Dawn popped up. This is also when the Theosophical right. Society was formed. So right. it's an interesting so date range. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I grew up as, as a child and as a young person in the 60s and the 70s, where you have this other explosion of the metaphysical. So, I mean, I think sometimes it just... It's just the force is too strong to be contained and it just pops out. But I see, you know, there's all this sort of advertising now, but, oh, we live in this, you know, this, you know, renaissance of the magical arts now and, and, and the tarot. And, you know, I, I just hope it lasts. I hope this is forever because, you know, these are beautiful, <laughs> wonderful, powerful things. Yeah. And you mentioned people threw out these, these stories because they were the old Pulp Fiction magazines that people just discarded so haphazardly. And you grew up in, obviously, in a, the post-Pulp Fiction period, but were there any remnants of these stories lying around anywhere? Did you ever stumble across any in your youth? Yeah, I, I did. I mean, we had Marie Corelli novels. I don't know. You know, it's funny. I look back and see what I had. We lived in Elmhurst, Queens, in an apartment, and I lived with, you know, in a very immigrant community. And I look and I see, and I think I, I can name exactly, you know, the books that we had in our house and in, you know, my relatives' houses and... You know, these are the albums we had and these are, you know, because it wasn't that much. I can literally name everything that was in there. And I, I'm not quite sure how we got some, but like, how did this turn up? But we had Marie Corelli book, a book called Ziska, The Problem of a, a Wicked Soul. And it's a reincarnation novel. And I just, to this day, I'm a sucker for an, a reincarnation love story. Uh, I, I love them. And I just, you know... It, it, it was mind blowing for me to read these things. I just thought it was fabulous. And I, I read a lot. I, I am a compulsive reader. If I am sitting like at a table and no one is speaking, you know, if I'm not, if I'm by myself and there's nothing else to do, I'll read the back of like a cracker box or something. You know, I know, I know all the ingredients because I, I, it's just what I do. So I would literally go through all my school libraries, every book they had on witches. And a lot of those books were like books of old short stories. In some ways, we live in more conservative, more prudish times than we did when I was a child. I, I would go through every anthology of witch stories or magical stories or fairy tales or folk tales. And so I, a lot of them crossed my path. I mean, and there are a lot of bad ones. You know, one of the things I do as an editor, I want this to be an enjoyable experience. So, I mean, there is a lot of casual racism, misogyny, homophobia, anti-Semitism, all of that. I did my best to eliminate those stories. I, I wanted people just to have a good time with this. It's not a, this is not an academic book where, you know, I'm going to tell you about the history of, of these stories. In these stories, the magical practitioners are treated with respect. You know, and I made sure there are not just, not just male occult detectives, there are female occult detectives, and there are female writers, as well as the male writers. I want this to be a positive experience for the, the reader. So, I mean, I, I, I waited through a lot of the track to get there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you did a good job of balancing the selection for sure. And I do have a question about that. You know, going back to, I guess, your love for research, how did you find and select the 13 stories that make up this anthology? What was that process like? Fun. <laughs> <laughs> this actually started when I was doing Fantastic and Forgotten, the previous book. And Fantastic and Forgotten, I had been given a title. You know, I had just started working for Weiser. They had put out a book uh, previously called The Weiser Book of the Horror and the Occult, which I, I believe was curated by Lon Milo Ducat. And they gave me 
a title and I worked with it. And I was just picking stories I liked and that I was in the mood for. And, you know, well, some of it is, you know, I used to be a disc jockey, freeform disc jockey. And so, you know, you, you go in the air and you pick songs that are, you know, that you think people will like, but that are also sort of reflective of your mood at that moment. So Fantastic and Forgotten is very much like that. But while I was doing it, you know, there are a couple of cult detective stories in there. As I was gathering those stories, I realized just how many occult detective stories there were. I was aware they existed, but I wasn't aware of... I, I mean, I could do volume two of Wiser Book of Occult Detectives, or three, very easily. And I, at that point, I stopped. And it was very specifically the Helena Blavatsky story, Cave of the Echoes, because that almost went into the previous book. And then I realized this topic deserves a book of its own, and luckily they let me do it. Um, you know, I went to them and I said, I, I think we should do this next. And they let me. And so then I started, whenever I would come across them, I would just, I would, I would put them in. A, I, you know, I, I have numerous, numerous versions of um, esoteric anthologies pretty much ready to go. I, you know, I haven't written an introduction, but I have stories organized by theme. You know, it, it's just what I do. So, I mean, you know, if I should be lucky enough to, to do another of these, I, 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 am, I am ready to go. But I just, started, I just started putting them together. I knew some of them already. I knew The Pot of Tulips, which is the first story, because that's a New York City story. And I have spent a good part of my life either in or near New York. And that story amuses me because I used to work in Midtown Manhattan. I, I know the Port Authority, the bus terminal, like the back of my hand. And essentially, the story takes place in that neighborhood. But in 1855, that was the country. And um, it was where somebody went for a summer house. And I just, I, I just, I enjoy that. I, I enjoy reading that. I had some of the others. It, it is very much like putting together a program. Some of my favorite stories are not in here because really my favorite stories are, are, are novellas. And novellas are, let's just say, 10,000 words long or more. And in, if people are going to buy a book, you need to have a certain number of stories in here. This one has 13 stories in, in, in this one. The previous book has 18 stories. You know, I don't know. Will people pay for a book with only three stories, even if they're really good stories? I don't know. But, you know, I really wanted to have... There's a story called Ancient Sorceries. And unless you are very scared of cats, if you have not read it, you should read it. It's a wonderful story. But it's I long. Have, I have not <laughs> read it. Who's the author? It's, it's, it's another Algernon Blackwood. And there is an Algernon Blackwood in here. And I love Algernon Blackwood. There's another story called Sand. That's a wonderful story. Alg Algernon Blackwood is one of my favorite writers. But a lot of his, a lot of his books are, are, are lengthy. You know, they're not novels. The one in here is A Victim of Higher Space featuring John Silence, Dr. John Silence, which is such a great mm -hmm. name. And Dr. John Silence in this one does a little bit more detective detecting in ancient sorceries someone comes back from a trip to france and tells the story about a stay in a village and i don't want to give away more of the story but um in that one dr silence just basically listens he is silent so he he isn't doing as much there's another one you know sheridan looking new i have the story green tea in here which i love and a lot of these stories have twists i, I don't want to give away too much but the story that I really wanted to have was Carmilla, the vampire story, which, again, it's a story where he, he's really, you know, a lot of it is he's listening to, to the story. It's his case notes. But Green Tea is a great story also. Yeah. And that was my last question about the book here was to just tell people a little bit about the stories and some of the authors, because we've sort of peppered them throughout the conversation here. But uh, two people you didn't mention who have stories in here are Helena Blavatsky and Dion Fortune. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle does too. So did you have a particular favorite among the 13 here? There isn't a story here that I dislike. Did I, do I have a favorite? I really like that Helena Blavatsky story. I, I like the Dion Fortune. I actually, Dion Fortune, out of all these people, is probably the best known for writing occult fiction. People know her for her novels, The Sea Priestess or The Goatfoot God. But she has a series of short stories featuring Dr. Taverner, her occult detective. I, those are some of my favorite, favorite of her works. They're just wonderful. 
there's also one in in the previous book in Fantastic and Forgotten. I don't know. You know, that's that's like saying which of my children do you like the best? That's a very hard one. I, I don't know. You know, I love Algernon Blackwood. It's not this is not my favorite Algernon Blackwood story, but I really like him as a writer. Uh, I like the vampire, the Elmer Van stories. Um, that's a great one. The thing with these stories is many of the people who wrote them were occultists. You know, I get the, I get my books mixed up. So I'm like, I know which stories in which book, you know. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of Golden Dawn authors in these two compilations, authors who were members of the Golden Dawn, but who also were writing because, you know, so this is how people got paid. They got paid by the word sometimes. So you have this this combination of entertainment or an attempt to write a story, but also, you know, th- their knowledge shines through. They're just fabulous. Helena Blavatsky claims that story was not fiction, though. The, this story, it's a mysterious disappearance. It, it is the case of, um, you know, that, that could be a Dateline story. The story she has here could <laughs> yeah. be a story that you would see on Dateline. Yeah. But she claims that it was not fiction, she claimed that one of her relatives, there, there is a shaman who, who solves the crime through shamanic means very dramatically at a party. And she claimed that one of her relatives were, was actually at the party and told her about it. And she wrote various versions of it. Uh, you know, and she, she spent most of her life, good parts of her life, very financially challenged. So, you know, she supported herself sometimes by, I mean, among other things, as a, as, as a writer of fiction before her her bestsellers, her nonfiction. That, that's a great story. Yeah, and her story is actually, it's probably more real than anything you do see on Dateline, but uh, that's just me. <laughs> yeah. So, Judica, I want to wrap up with one more thing here. In addition to all that you've published already, you actually have an unpublished manuscript about fertility and infertility. I've heard yeah. you talk about it a couple times. I haven't really heard you go into detail about it. It seems like another encyclopedia in the making, perhaps. So, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Like, how does one collect enough words for a manuscript about fertility? Well, if you do it long enough, you collect enough words. It is, in some ways, I realized later that it it is sort of the template for 5,000 spells. I have been studying the magical arts all my life, but that was something very personal for me. That wasn't, I didn't set out to be a metaphysical author. At, At a point, I had um, a fertility issue of my own. And this is pre, you know, I was a forerunner, pre, you know, fertility, technology, industry, everything. And um, I was not satisfied with the answers, the the suggestions and solutions that were offered to me medically. And so I, I was convinced that there would be a book, I I knew there were folkloric methods of healing and fertility or, or providing fertility. And I was so sure that there would be a book about this that I went to a bookstore to look for one and I couldn't find one. So I just I just started looking and researching for my myself. And, um, you know, I am my own testimonial. You know, I, I do have two children now and I just started looking. But eventually, you know, this is almost a, you know, if you look into the abyss, the abyss looks back. Eventually it hooked me in. The topic hooked me in. And there's so much of it. And I was very, you feel very attached to the other people who have also been determined, you know, it's very magical, determined not to just let fate determine the course of your life, but who are determined to take control over it. And you become very attached to these, you know, all these anonymous people from centuries ago. And I just started researching and researching and researching and compiling and compiling and organizing just because you know i enjoyed it and it was just for myself and my collection of other spells occurred around the same time because in the beginning i was so focused i would just record things that applied to my collection but eventually i'd be finding all these other interesting things and i didn't know what to do with it but they were sort of too interesting to let go so I would just, I, I mean, I have, you know, I, I can't even tell you, I have cut down a forest of, a rainforest worth of, like, file cards. Uh, you know, I have I have little <laughs> file cards with all kinds of notes on them, organized in boxes and color-coded with different color rubber bands. And after a while, I would just start collecting other things, too. I did send that manuscript. 
I send my manuscript out every couple of years, and it is incredibly lucky for me. No one has ever published it for reasons because it, it is too overlapping. It has spiritual and magical and physical and booksellers. Where do you put it on a bookshelf? And that is still an issue. It had a chapter, has a chapter of magic spells in it. And when I sent it out to a publisher, he rejected the book, but said, would I expand that chapter of magic spells into a more general book? And that's how I became a metaphysical author. I am working now on another kind kind of encyclopedic book for Harper One uh, that will be out, I think, at the end of 2019, another spell book. But I think once this is done, maybe I'm going to go back and try to publish that fertility book again. Yeah, I think you should. And I'm glad that you, I think, you know, there's this old phrase, I don't know how it's worded exactly, but it's something like, if you think there should be a book about it, and there's not one, then you should be the one to probably write it. Yeah, I think so. I, I tell that to people, oh, people write to me, and they want me to write these books. And they tell me, you should write a book that says this and this and this and this. And I always turn around and say, if you can see the book, that's your book. You need to write that book. Absolutely. I would agree with that. So, Yurika, this has been really cool. I appreciate you hanging out for as long as you did. I know you're extremely busy. So before we go here, tell people where they can find more of you and your work if they're interested. Oh, well, I hope you're interested. <laughs> um, I can be, I, my, books can, my books are really well distributed. I'm very lucky for that. So you can find my books literally wherever fine books are sold, online, offline. If you look at my website, www www.judikaiwles.com. There is, it is, it, it really needs to be updated, but you, you can see my encyclopedias on there and you can get a sense of what's in them. And uh, I can be found on Twitter, on Facebook, on the Definitely. web. <laughs> on the web, anywhere across the web for sure. Yeah, we'll link, yeah. We'll link everybody to those places in Thank the show you. notes for sure. So, hey, thanks again for hanging out. Thanks again for your time. And I will talk Thank to you. you soon. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. That was fun. And there you have it. My thanks again to Judica Illis. What a fountain of youth and knowledge she is. And I'll tell you, much like the last episode with Aiden Wachter, I really vibe with Judica's general approach here. We have so many things in common, and it is absolutely crazy to me that we do, because we come from very different places, we've lived very different lives, but to sit on this call with her and hear her just gush with passion for the things she's interested in and the things she's good at, her own talents and skills, I mean, that is honestly, that is so damn sexy and you know not in a weird perverse way but in a confident empowering way because i like to think or at least i've been told that that i speak like that some of my closest friends they'll tell you i'm one passionate dude i speak with a lot of it in my voice maybe i'm too passionate sometimes passionate aggressive i call it but damn it is sexy to hear someone speak like that at least to me and the thing i found most interesting or maybe the thing I found the most common ground with, was her comments about the research process. And when I look at what I'm doing here with this podcast, this is a giant research project for me, and each episode is like a chapter in the book that I've researched and then authored. But the research is ultimately, at the end of the day, about myself. This is about me getting to know myself and improving myself, and I think that's why some of you guys dig this. I think that's why these conversations resonate with some of you, because it's not really about the information as cool and as interesting as some of it is. It's more about getting to know and embracing those hidden aspects of yourself. And that's what I think magic and alchemy and all the rest of this really is. I mean, sure, you can use what you learn to bind politicians or make money, but is that the best use of it? Is that the best use of your energy? Shouldn't you maybe focus on being less of an asshole on Facebook or, God forbid, in your actual day-to-day face-to-face interactions? Maybe all this spellcraft is better served on, you know, things that matter. And ultimately, all that matters is you and your character. And how about that fertility manuscript we chatted about? Why a publisher wouldn't want to publish that is beyond my realm of comprehension. And that may inherently be the problem of publishing these days. Things have to seemingly fit into boxes with labels on shelves. I can only imagine the frustration Judica has with that, considering this manuscript sounds a lot like a passion project of hers. And who knows, maybe the newly established Occulture Media will venture into publishing and try to do something with that. 
Of course, any venture of that caliber requires capital, and that's something I just don't have right now. But with your continued support on Patreon, I get closer and closer to actualizing ideas like that. And I had a handful of new patrons sign up to support last week, so some shoutouts to Chris, Catalina, Weird Web Radio, and Pirate Jenny for their recent contributions. And a special shout-out to Nick, who became an official executive producer of the show. All of your support is appreciated, and if you want to join these fine folks in supporting this project of mine and any future projects, check out patreon.com slash occulture. Four levels of support starting at just two bucks a month. Two bucks, that's it. That's cheaper than a morning latte. Also, don't forget to grab some merch. These are the final days of our fall Equinox sale, and coupon code Equinox gets you 10% off all orders. Or is it Equinox? I don't, I don't know. Of course, that also means these are the final days of summer, and as I look back on the last three months, I have to say this has been one of the more memorable summers I've had. A lot of things have come into focus for me and my life during these long, sun-drenched days, both on and off air here. And whether you realize it or not, each and every one of you have played a role in that. So happy Equinox Equinox to all of you. And however you celebrate this seasonal transition, I hope you do it safely, and I hope you do it magically. Anyway, I am out of time, so until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh.